The History of Ancient Rome The Roman legacy to the modern world in various spheres is inestimable. From Rome we have inherited, among other things, a reverence for the law. Certainly Rome influenced the founding fathers of the United States. The Roman Catholic Church is the manifestation of Rome in the modern world. The images and themes of Roman history and culture continue to influence modern culture. Rome's is an interesting history to study due to patterns of change. Modern popular culture remains enthralled by images and themes drawn from the pagan Roman world. Julius Caesar assassinated. Nero fiddling as Rome burns and gladiators fighting to the death before clamoring crowds. Roman society changed enormously over its long duration. It evolved from a monarchy into a republic and then back to a monarchy, it changed from a pagan to a Christian empire, and culturally it evolved from a rustic and crude place to a sophisticated and Hellenized one. Due to the scarcity of evidence, the scope for interpretation is extremely wide in ancient history. The circumscribed body of ancient evidence is itself subject to constant re-evaluation and interpretation. Pre-Roman Italy and the Etruscans The Romans were not the first people to inhabit the Italian peninsula. They were not even the first people to become powerful or influential. Within the Italian peninsula the geography of the Italian peninsula offered many benefits to its inhabitants. The peninsula is well watered and well endowed with natural resources. The Alps in the north and the Apennine range that runs down the center of Italy provide springs, streams, and rivers more than sufficient to supply the inhabitants. The largest rivers in Italy and the ones with which we shall be mostly concerned are the Pa and Arno rivers in the north and the Tiber in central Italy. The mountainous nature of the country guaranteed an abundance of wood and oars for the ancient Italians and pasture for their sheep and goats. The peninsula's plains are fertile. The three main plains in Italy are the Per River Valley in the north, the plain of Latium around Rome, and Campania around Naples. Campania, in particular, with its volcanic soil, pleasant Mount Vesuvius, the source of Campania's fertile volcanic soil, the plain of Latium, on the north edge of which lay the Tiber River and the site of Rome, is surrounded by the sea to the west and mountains to the east. A range of low hills is located in the center of the plain. All of these plains are fertile. By the time of Roman expansion into Italy, all were inhabited by settled people practicing agriculture. With the exception of the Greek colonizers and the Etruscans, pre-Roman, Italy was inhabited by non-urbanized tribal peoples. The tribal cultures of pre-Roman Italy are difficult to study. Archaeology shows that Italy had human inhabitants as early as the Stone Age. Pre-Roman tribal Italy was a quilt of languages and cultures. Archaeology and linguistics are our main avenues for studying this period. Two archaeological keys are burial styles and pottery. And at least 40 languages and dialects have been determined. A broad division appears to have existed between settled agriculturists in the plains and their threatening mountain-dwelling neighbors. The situation in 400 BC was as follows. North to south, the Celtic Gauls had control of the Pavalli, the Etruscans were to their south, then came the Romans and the Latins. The Oscans and Samnites controlled central Italy and parts of Campania, and finally, the Greeks were found in the south. The Greeks and Etruscans were urbanized cultures. The Greek colonies in Italy were localized affairs and centered on coastal cities, notably Naples and Tarentum. The Etruscans, too, 
were an urbanized people and were much influenced by the Greeks. The origins of the Etruscans are unclear. No Etruscan literature survives, they are studied through archaeology. Later Roman tales about them. Mentions in Greek sources and surviving inscriptions in their ill-understood language. They may have been migrants from the eastern Mediterranean. More likely, they were a native Italian culture, called Villanovan, that became urbanized circa 800 to 700 BC. Perhaps through contact with the Greeks. They were not a politically unified Ed people, but were very influential in Italy. They had 13 a league of 12 cities, which often warred with each other. They were united by language and religion. And these cities could occasionally work in concert. Originally ruled by kings, many Etruscan cities became oligarchies, ruled by councils of leading families. The nature of Etruscan control in Italy is unclear. Earlier scholars imagined a sort of Etruscan empire in Italy, stretching from the Pavalli to Campania. This empire collapsed in the 5th and 4th centuries BC. In the face of resistance from the Greeks in the south and incursions of Gauls in the north. More recently, it has been proposed that there was a looser sphere of Etruscan influence. Predominantly on the cultural plane, there was no Etruscan empire. This debate affects how historians read the early history of Rome, particularly the question of Etruscan Rome under the last kings. The Etruscans were absorbed by the Romans, but they greatly influenced Roman culture. The main areas of Etruscan influence on the Romans were in religion and statecraft, but also in architecture. From the late 3rd century BC onward, the Etruscans were thoroughly absorbed into the Roman state. And by the age of the emperors, they had ceased to exist as a distinct cultural group. The Foundation of Rome Later Romans preserved two tales about the origin of their people and their city. Both are well known to most people. One of them surrounds the twins Romulus and Remus. The other surrounds the Trojan hero Aeneas. The story of Romulus and Remus, their escape from death as infants. And their founding of Rome has characteristic folkloric elements that suggest it is very old and local in origin. The story of Aeneas founding Rome, on the other hand, derives from a Hellenized source, reflecting Greek legends, but it is probably older than many have assumed. In this story, Aeneas, the sole survivor of Troy, wandered the Mediterranean before settling in Italy at Lavinium, where he founded a town. The two stories were united into a single tradition by making Romulus and Remus descendants of Aeneas. Aeneas founded the Roman people, Romulus and Remus founded the city of Rome. Archaeological evidence suggests that settlement at Rome began as early as 1500 BC but it does not offer any evidence that substantially contradicts the ancient legends. The site of Rome was advantageous. It overlooked a ford in the Tiber near an island in the stream, it could control north-south traffic between Etruria and Latium and east-west traffic from the interior to the coast. It was hilly, defensible, and well-watered. Signs of early human habitation date to circa 1500 BC, with the first permanent settlement, as indicated by graves, founded in circa 1000 BC, originally and into the 8th century BC. Rome was a series of small, separate villages on neighboring hilltops, evidence of these settlements has been found. At some stage, the dates are impossible to establish, these communities coalesced into a single community. And Rome, as an entity, 
was born. Spectacular finds on the Palatine Hill in Rome in the 1930s revealed postholes for wooden huts that dated to the mid-8th century, circa 750 BC. Later Romans maintained a hut on the Palatine that they called the Hut of Romulus. That said, Archaeology cannot confirm Rome's founding legends either. Archaeological evidence needs to be interpreted to make sense. The presence of worship centers embracing Aeneas in Lavinium does not prove the Aeneas legend, it is likely the result of the fame of the legend. Not vice versa. The coincidence of the Palatine huts and the traditional foundation date does not prove the Romulus legend. In fact, the settlement of which the huts are part dates to 1000 BC. Archaeological evidence is mute, it cannot prove legendary evidence. But Occasionally it can disprove it. The archaeology does suggest an early Pattern of settlement at Rome becoming more complex in the 8th century and coalescing into a single community sometime after that. Therefore, the issue of sources for this early period of Roman history is an important consideration to bear in mind. The Kings of Rome All our sources are unanimous that Rome was initially ruled by kings. They number the kings as seven. The first one being Romulus. Romulus was the founder of Rome. He also became its first king. The seven kings in the so-called regal period were in order Romulus Numa Pompilius Tullius Hostilius and Ansius Martius, the Latin or Sabine kings followed by Tarquinius Priscus Servius Tullius and Tarquinius Superbus, the two Tarquins were Etruscans. Each king had a set of stories attached to him. The sources available to our main account of the early period in Livy were scant. Livy had access to now lost written accounts by earlier writers, all, however, were far later than the regal period. There were received legends. Some archival and epigraphic material may have survived for Livy. But not for us. Family histories also filled out the picture. For the modern scholar. Comparative material from other early monarchies is available. As well as archaeological investigation of early Rome. The operation of Roman kingship was noteworthy. The kings were not. Hereditary, but were chosen by election from among a council of nobles, the Senate. Between kings, an interrex held office. Kings had authority over three areas of government. Military affairs, administration of justice, and religion. The existence of the kings themselves is not in doubt. But the historicity of the individual reigns is much more troublesome. There is little doubt about the Romulus. One of Rome's founders was also its first king according to tradition. Regal Society The regal society of Rome was typically archaic. It was dominated by aristocratic landowners. There seems to have been from the start a division between free and slave. It seems that the Romans were a slaving society from very early on, as were most societies. Below the dominant aristocrats in the regal society of Rome were those tied by bonds of favor and obligation. Among the freeborn population, the broadest distinction was that between citizen and non-citizen. All citizens were grouped into units called tribes. Initially there were three tribes, but in later centuries they reached a total of 35. One of the chief duties of citizenship was military service in the Roman army. 
which fought in the phalanx formation at this early date. As with contemporary societies in Greece, the citizenry was led primarily by aristocratic landowning families. All families, it seems, were grouped into clans. The so-called three names of Roman citizens reflects the primacy of the gens in the familial and social order. Prominent families and common families were tied by a system called clientela or clientship. A patron granted favors and generally helped a client. And in return he received support, loyalty, and due deference and respect. Clientela helped offset the horizontal stratification of Roman society. However, not all classes or persons were involved in the clientela system. At this early date, it is possible that the first social orders appeared. In Roman society an order was a social rank. A statement of status. The first order to appear seems to have been the patriciate. Patricians were defined by birth. And thus by their names, they were the most privileged group within the aristocracy. The circumstances surrounding the emergence of the patricians are obscure. Various reconstructions have been offered by modern scholars. Whether or not the other social order, the plebs, was in existence in this early period is not clear. Politics under the regal system of government was controlled by the aristocrats more by than the kings. Kings were chosen from among the members of the Senate and were ratified by the people meeting in assembly. The status of the Senate in this very early period is unclear, it may have been an ad hoc council of advisors to the king. The people were grouped into voting units called curiae and met in an assembly called the curiate assembly. There are parallels to this in Greek and other archaic cultures. The main function of the curiate assembly was to ratify the Senate's choice of a new king and to officially confer the power of command on him. The Beginnings of the Republic In the Roman tradition, the early Republic faced some immediate challenges, which it overcame by having all kinds of wonderful characters who had the right moral fiber to stand up against these challenges meet them, and bring the Republic into a new dawn. In Roman tradition, the Republic was founded following an atrocious act that spurred a coup d'etat. Tarquinius Superbus, the last king of Rome, was a poor ruler who enacted various policies that were unpopular. His son, Sextus Tarquinius, raped Lucretia, a nobleman's wife, who subsequently committed suicide. This assault sparked a coup. A family friend of Lucretia's husband, L. Junius Brutus, helped the dead. Woman's incensed family to organize resistance against Superbus, many. Members of the Tarquin clan were also part of the plot. Tarquinius was forced to abandon Rome. A plot to restore the monarchy led to Brutus having to execute his own two sons. Assisted by Lars Porcena, king of nearby Clusium, Tarquinius attempted to regain Rome by force of arms but failed. A subsequent attack by Porcena on the Latins failed at the Battle of Aricia, 506 BC and he withdrew back to Clusium. Another ancient tradition records that the Romans surrendered to Porcena and that he imposed a humiliating treaty on Rome. Modern scholars have treated this cycle of stories in different ways, none. Accept them as they are. The stories are, on the face of it, typical of the early history of Rome. Romantic. Heroic and didactic. Modern scholars have come up with a variety of alternative reconstructions of events. 
such as reading the expulsion of the Tarquins against the background of waning Etruscan power in Italy in the 5th century BC. The transition from monarchy to republic was not a single dramatic event, but a slow process stretching into the mid 5th century BC. The story of Lucretia, on the other hand, is in fact not improbable. Given comparable personal events in other royal dynasties that had broad political effects. Following the alternative ancient tradition, perhaps Porsena took Rome and abolished the monarchy before retiring after Arisha. In the end, though, the evidence is just too unreliable to be sure about what happened in detail. The young republic began developing its government and its form evolved over the centuries. The early years are, unsurprisingly, somewhat unclear. Kings were replaced by two magistrates, called consuls or praetors. Later consular lists go all the way back to 509 BC. But there are some suspicions that the very early names are later interpolations. From the early republic, the consuls shared power with colleagues with limited tenure. There were two popular assemblies. In times of great emergency, a dictator could be installed for six months to deal with the emergency. The dictator nominated a second in command, the master of horse. The former king's duties now devolved to the magistrates and to priests the most important of whom was the Pontifex Maximus, there was also a Rex Sacrorum, probably a purely religious incarnation of the old king. Roman expansion in Italy Roman expansion in Italy can be broken down into three phases. First, there is a long period of gaining control over their immediate neighbors. The Latins For the first four centuries of its existence, Rome was occupied with gaining control over Latium. The early dealings of Rome with its Latin neighbors are shrouded in obscurity, but they appear varied and complex. The sources for the early expansion of Rome are not strong on fact, rather, they are full of heroic and patriotic tales that served as models for good behavior in later generations. From the Third Samnite War onward. However, our material improves considerably. The sources depict the king's mixing war and diplomacy in their dealings with the Latins. The transition from the monarchy to the republic weakened the Roman position. But victory over the Latins at the Battle of Lake Regillus in 499 BC recovered the situation. The Treaty of Cassius in 493 BC established a new relationship between Rome and the Latins, who were formed into the so-called Latin League. The outline of the treaty seems clear, but the details are not. It was a military alliance, establishing a non-aggression pact, mutual friends and enemies, and equal division of spoils of war. Romans were to command any joint forces. But it is unclear whether Rome was a member of the Latin League or whether the treaty was a bilateral agreement between Rome and the League. The requirements of defense against continuous incursions by tribal mountain peoples in the neighborhood of Latium strengthened Rome's position among the Latins. The Equi and Volsci Tribal Mountain Dwellers launched annual raids into Latium between circa 500 and 440 BC. Rome and the Latins resisted in tandem. During the course of the 5th century, Rome had begun a series of conflicts with Vi, a powerful Etruscan town north of the Tiber. In 396, the Romans captured Vi and took all the spoils for themselves as the Latins were about to fight over their treatment by the Romans. Disaster struck from the north. 
Gallic raiders from the Pavali region, known as Gallia Cisalpina, defeated a combined Roman force at Allia in 390 BC and captured Rome. The Romans paid the Gauls off, and the Gauls left. The Gallic raid humiliated the Romans, but does not seem to have greatly undermined their overall position. Roman incursions into Etruria and Latium continued until 338 BC, when the Romans defeated a combined Latin force and reshaped the Latin League to their own needs. The Samnite Wars were on a larger scale than any wars previously fought by Rome, and Roman victory in the conflict secured Roman power over all of central Italy. The Samnites were formidable opponents. They were a federation of tribal people living in the mountains of central Italy. With the end of the Second Samnite War, free Italians could have no illusions about what the Romans were ultimately aiming for. The conflict, called the Third Samnite War, was, in fact, the last stand of free Italy in the face of Roman expansion. Although sparked by Roman assistance to people attacked by the Samnites, the Third Samnite War became a pan Italic conflict. A coalition of Samnites, Umbrians, Etruscans, and Gauls fought the Romans at Centinum in 295 BC, the largest battle yet fought on Italian soil. The Roman victory led to the incorporation of the Samnites into the Roman administration of Italy in 290 B. C. The Romans were now dominant in central Italy. Although some mopping up operations continued for several decades, Roman conflict with the Greek colony of Tarentum led to the invasion of Pyrrhus, Rome's first overseas enemy. Tarentum pressed by Roman expansion, called on King Pyrrhus of Epirus for help. Pyrrhus invaded Italy in 281 BC with an army of 25,000 men and 20 elephants, commanding a well-trained and well-equipped army fighting in the formidable Macedonian phalanx formation. Pyrrhus defeated the Romans twice in 280 and 279 BC. After a fruitless campaign in Sicily, Pyrrhus returned to mainland Italy in 275 BC and fought the Romans to a standstill at Beneventum in 275. Then Pyrrhus withdrew to his kingdom, leaving Rome mistress of all of the Italian peninsula south of the Pavali. The expansion of Rome in Italy carried important ramifications for Roman politics, society, and culture. The authority of the Senate was greatly increased. Originally an advisory body made up of the wealthiest and most influential Romans. By the time of Pyrrhus' invasion, the Senate had become the dominant political entity in the state. This was a consequence of the constant warfare, which placed a premium on experienced commanders. There was great economic growth, as reflected in population increases, more building in Rome, an increase in available luxury goods, an increase in the number of slaves, and so on. There was also cultural change in the form of greater contacts with the Etruscans and, especially, the Greeks, the Roman Confederation in Italy. What makes the Romans remarkable is that they evolved apparently quite early in their career in imperialism a method of privilege sharing with their territories. The Romans developed early in their history a system of privilege sharing with allied or related communities that differed from the usually harsh treatment ancient victors showed to their vanquished foes. Although the origins of the system are obscure, it seems that the Romans could, under certain conditions, 
Extend the privileges of citizenship to other communities. By the 3rd century BC, a secondary citizenship status had emerged, the state without the vote. The Romans also embarked on a policy of colonization early in their history, and the foundation of colonies became an important diplomatic wing of Roman expansion in Italy. Roman colonies were founded in newly conquered territories and at strategically important locations. Colonies were initially comprised of Romans and Latins, the former being the largest group. Colonists enjoyed what came to be called Latin rights, which was a sort of restricted Roman citizenship. The Roman foundation of colonies was carried on in peacetime. But it could be provocative, as when it contributed to the outbreak of the Second Samnite War. As Roman power expanded, the Romans developed other degrees of community status, beginning with Tusculum in 381 BC. The Romans developed a community status below the colony, called the municipium. The rights and status of a municipium in the early period are unclear. But in later periods, the municipium comprised local citizens whose ruling classes alone were admitted to Roman citizenship. Below the municipium, and especially in southern Italy, the Romans established treaty states which enjoyed only those privileges stipulated in their treaty with Rome. The developed confederation of Italy allowed the Romans to divide and conquer the peoples of Italy, and it offered great benefits to the Romans. The final form of the confederation, as it had evolved over centuries, ranked subject communities in a variety of bilateral status relationships with Rome. The system also provided Rome with a large pool of military manpower. Whatever the status of the subject community, provision of troops for the army was a universal requirement. Rome could therefore impose the basic duty of citizenship and military service without being obliged offer to the privileges of citizenship in return. Thus, approximately half of the Roman army came from the subject states of the Roman Confederation of Italy. This early system of administration of conquered territories had several important long-term consequences. It was to play a vital role in facilitating Roman overseas expansion by virtue of the huge manpower Rome could bring to bear on any given situation. In times of crisis, it offered Rome security. As when Pyrrhus failed to detach Rome's allies from the Confederation or during the Second Punic War. When an altered version of the Confederation was extended beyond Italy, it was to form the basis for the stability and longevity of the later Roman Empire. Carthage and the First Punic War Rome's rise to dominance can broadly be divided into two halves. The first deals with the Western Mediterranean, specifically the city of Carthage. In the second half, it turns its attention to the highly developed Hellenist and Hellenistic half of the Eastern Mediterranean in the period beginning around 200 BC or so. Rome's rise to dominance of the entire Mediterranean basin falls into two broad phases. First came the conflicts with Carthage that led to Rome controlling the entire western Mediterranean. Second came Rome's complex involvement in the affairs of the Hellenistic kingdoms to the east. Carthage was an ancient Phoenician city run by a mercantile oligarchy. Located in what is modern-day Tunisia. The city had a long history of involvement in the western Mediterranean. By tradition, Carthage was founded in 814 BC by Phoenician traders. Located on a superb harbor with a fertile hinterland and endowed with an enterprising populace, 
The city quickly rose to a position of power. By the 6th century BC, Carthaginian trading posts could be found all along North Africa, in western Sicily, in Sardinia, and in Spain. Conflict with the Greek colonies of Sicily, especially Syracuse, was frequent in the 5th and 4th centuries BC. By the time the Romans had conquered the Italian mainland, a sort of balance of power obtained in Sicily, with Syracuse dominant in the eastern half of the island and Carthage in the west. Originally ruled by a governor, Carthage's autocracy had early given way to an oligarchy of ruling families. As in the Roman Republican oligarchy, two judges were elected annually, and there was a Senate-like council. An unusual feature was a permanent court of 104 lifetime members, who scrutinized the affairs of professional generals and admirals. The First Punic War started small and by accident but developed into a titanic struggle for control of Sicily. The spark that ignited the First Punic War was small. Italian adventurers, called the Mamertines, seized the eastern Sicilian city of Messana and, when pressured by Syracuse, appealed first to Carthage and then to Rome. The humiliation of the Carthaginian fleet and the movement of the Romans into Sicily caused the Carthaginians to send troops to Sicily to crush the Mamertines. This affair brought Rome and Carthage into open conflict. Roman frustration at the Punic ability to resupply Sicily by sea led to the second phase of the war. Fought on the Tyrrhenian Sea and in Africa, 260 to 255 BC. The Romans built a huge fleet in a few months and put to sea in 260 BC, defeating the Carthaginians at the Battle of Mile. A Roman invasion of North Africa in 256 BC ended with the ambush and defeat of the Roman force in 255 BC, followed shortly thereafter by the destruction of the Roman fleet in a storm off Sicily. The third and final phase of the war was fought on Sicily and the surrounding seas, 255 to 241 BC. The Carthaginians fought most of this phase of the war as a guerrilla campaign from their impregnable bases at Mount Eryx and Mount Hercht in western Sicily. Both sides also vied for control of naval bases in Sicily. Carthaginian cost-effective thinking hampered their war effort and in 241 B.C. When they faced a new Roman fleet at the Egates Islands, they were roundly defeated. The Carthaginians surrendered. And the Romans imposed weighty terms. The Romans imposed a huge war indemnity and debarred Carthage from Sicily. The First Punic War had important ramifications for Rome and for Carthage. Rome enjoyed several benefits as a result of its victory. They had been drawn out of the Italian peninsula and now possessed their first overseas province, the fertile island of Sicily. They now possessed the largest fleet in the Mediterranean. They took advantage of their FLEET and Punic weakness to annex Sardinia and Corsica in 238 BC, further encroaching into the traditional Carthaginian sphere of activity. Roman tenacity and determination in the face of adversity had been made clear to all. Defeat drove Carthage to new pastures. The closing of the seas around Sicily and Italy drove Carthage westward. Between 241 and 220 BC, the Carthaginians carved out a small empire in Spain. In certain Carthaginian circles, the Roman victory was too bitter a pill to swallow and an even larger conflict was to emerge from this circumstance. The Second Punic, or Hannibalic, War. Carthaginian expansion in Spain proved to be the spark for the second. Major conflict between Rome and Carthage. The Second Punic War, which took a very different course from the first one. 
while Carthage was active in Spain. Roman attention was diverted to the Adriatic Sea and the Pavali. The activities of pirates along the eastern Italian seaboard drove Rome to conduct military operations in Illyria on the eastern Adriatic. In 229 BC, the region was declared a Roman protectorate to block another Gallic incursion into Italy from Gallia Cisalpina. The Romans invaded the region in 225 BC and annexed it as a province in 220 BC. Carthaginian expansion in Spain provided the spark that ignited the Second Punic War. Under able leadership, the Carthaginians had gained control of much of eastern Spain by 220 BC. A fact finally noticed by the Romans. The main Carthaginian leader was Hamilcar Barca, a veteran of the Sicilian campaigns in the last phase of the First Punic War. He allegedly harbored an intense hatred of Rome. Hamilcar Barca was the father of Hannibal. Sometime in the mid-220s BC, the Romans and Carthaginians reached agreement on spheres of influence in Spain. According to the account of Polybius, the details of this Ebro treaty are disputed. Carthage undertook not the Second Punic War led to the annihilation of Carthage. The Teaching Company Collection To extend its power north of the river Ebro Whether the Romans undertook not to interfere south of this river is not made explicit in our sources. The Romans took under their protection the town of Saguntum, which lay south of the river Ebro. It is not clear when this agreement with Saguntum was reached, we do not know whether it was before or after the Ebro Agreement. Hannibal had been in command in Spain since 221 BC. War was declared in 219 BC. Following Hannibal's attack on Saguntum and the rejection by Carthage of a Roman ultimatum to hand him over for trial. The Second Punic War was fought simultaneously in several theaters of operation, and it stretched the resources of both sides to their limits. The Romans prepared for a replay of the First Punic War in Hannibal. However, the Romans faced one of history's greatest military minds. Hannibal seized the initiative and invaded Italy from the north, forcing the Romans to fight for their very survival. Hannibal marched his army over the Pyrenees, through hostile territory in southern France, and over the Alps. He arrived in Italy in the spring of 218 BC, catching the Romans completely by surprise. After defeating a small Roman force at Ticinus, Hannibal crushed a large Roman army at Trebia in 218 BC. The following year, he ambushed and destroyed a consular army at Lake Trasimene in Etruria. Facing this crisis, the Romans declared a dictator. Hugh Fabius Maximus, who adopted Fabian tactics in dealing with Hannibal during the rest of 217 BC. New consuls in 216 BC advocated crushing Hannibal with a single stroke. A joint consular army, some 80,000 strong, charged the Punic army at Kenny in 216 BC. The resulting defeat was the worst reverse ever inflicted on the Roman military. And it left Rome itself open to attack by Hannibal. Hannibal, however, could not drive home his advantage. The Romans did not negotiate a peace. As might have been expected, the Roman allies in central Italy stood firm and did not defect to Hannibal. Hannibal had no siege equipment and no local support to press a siege of Rome. Despite his spectacular early successes, Hannibal's subsequent campaign in Italy was little more than an irritant to the Romans. 
whose attentions were diverted elsewhere. The Romans were simultaneously fighting Carthaginian forces in Spain and Sicily. The Roman objective was to prevent reinforcement of Hannibal. The campaigns were difficult and marked by several Roman defeats. But eventually, the Romans prevailed in both theaters. Syracuse had foolishly sided with Hannibal after Cannae. It was taken in 211 BC. And Sicily was secured for Rome. Hasdrubal, Hannibal's brother, succeeded in breaking out of Spain and making it to Italy. But he was defeated and killed at the Battle of the Metaurus in 207 BC. The emergence of P. Cornelius Scipio on the Roman side spelled victory for the Romans. Victorious in Spain. Young Scipio advocated an invasion of Africa to draw Hannibal out of Italy. Despite intense opposition, he won. The debate and took a large force to Africa in 204 BC. Hannibal left Italy the following year to defend his homeland. He was defeated at the Battle of Zama in 202 BC. And Carthage surrendered. Roman terms were harsher than at the end of the First Punic War. Carthage had to pay a huge war indemnity. Carthaginian territories in Spain were ceded to the Romans. And in Africa large tracts of Punic territory were awarded to the native kingdom of Numidia, modern Algeria. Now a Roman ally. The Carthaginian navy was limited to ten ships. As for Hannibal, he was spared but hounded by the Romans for the next 20 years, until he was forced to commit suicide in 182 BC. The Second Punic War had several important consequences for Rome. It revealed much about the Roman mentality for the Carthaginians. It led to their ultimate annihilation. The Romans had become masters of the Western Mediterranean. In 196 BC, Rome formed two new provinces in Spain from the former Punic holdings there. Rome would be occupied for the next two centuries in conquering the rest of the Iberian Peninsula. Roman interest in the south of France increased, Rome was concerned with keeping a land route open to her new Spanish possessions. Control of this region was secured by 180 BC. Above all, the war highlighted Roman tenacity in the face of adversity and the iron grip the Romans held on Italy through their carefully constructed confederation. Carthage lost everything and was eventually destroyed by the suspicious Romans in 149 BC. In one of the most disgraceful episodes in Roman history, the Romans picked a fight with Carthage and besieged it. The Carthaginians held out for three years, but the city fell and was destroyed in 146 BC. The site remained vacant for a century. Rome in the Eastern Mediterranean. In three wars, the Romans took on and defeated the formidable kingdom of Antigonid Macedon. The First Macedonian War was fought while the Second Punic War was still in progress. Following Kenny, 216 BC, Philip V of Macedon made a pact with Hannibal since he believed that Roman power in Italy had been broken. To prevent Philip from aiding Hannibal, the Romans sent a small force against him and fomented local wars in northern Greece. The war was little more than a series of skirmishes. It came to a negotiated end in 204 BC. Nevertheless, the Macedonians' actions reinforced the determination of the Romans to whom Philip had now been identified as an enemy. The Second Macedonian War, 200-196 BC, was fought in the mountains of northern Greece and saw the Hellenistic king humiliated by defeat at Sinocephaly. 
Roman allies in the east. Pergamum and Rhodes. Appealed to Rome against Philip and the Seleucid king Antiochus III, who had signed a non aggression pact with each other. Despite being exhausted after the Second Punic War, the Romans sent a force into Macedon. After several years of cat and mouse maneuvering, the armies clashed by accident at Sinocephaly in 197 BC, and the Macedonians were roundly defeated. A negotiated peace saw Macedon debarred from Greece and the Aegean Sea. More importantly, the Romans now considered themselves protectors of the Greeks. A position strengthened by the complete withdrawal of Roman troops from the region in 194 BC. The Third Macedonian War spelled the end of the Antigonid dynasty in Macedon. Philip's son and successor, Perseus, abandoned his father's compliant stance toward the Romans and began infiltrating Greece and the Aegean. Diplomatic efforts to forestall a crisis failed, and war broke out in 172 BC. After three years of maneuvering, the Romans and Macedonians clashed at Pydna in northern Greece. Perseus was utterly defeated and deposed, and his kingdom was divided into four republics. When these republics revolted under an Antigonid pretender in 150 BC, Rome intervened and annexed the former kingdom as a province, 146 BC. In this year, Rome destroyed Corinth to punish rebellious free Greeks. The Romans now had a permanent presence in the eastern Mediterranean. While the conflicts with Macedon were continuing, the Romans also defeated Seleucid Syria and became the masters of the eastern Mediterranean. Despite the Roman declaration of a free Greece in 196 BC, many Greeks were suspicious of Rome's ultimate intentions. Disillusioned with Roman hegemony, in 193 the Aetolian League invited Antiochus III of Syria to liberate Greece. The Romans were already suspicious of Antiochus because of his pact with Philip and his harboring of Hannibal at court. When Antiochus landed in Greece in 192 BC, he was met with Roman arms. He was driven out completely in 190 BC. The Romans counterattacked into Asia in 189 BC. And, although outnumbered by a factor of three, defeated a massive Seleucid force at the Battle of Magnesia in that year. The Roman true power, as far as the Romans were concerned at this time, was not controlling territory. It was just this sort of incident, telling people what to do and they obeyed. General Scipio Africanus was once again a victor over a more powerful foe. Antiochus was forced to pay a vast indemnity. And Syria was debarred from operating in Asia Minor. In 168 BC, the Rhodians attempted to mediate between Rome and Perseus of Macedon. Roman suspicion was aroused and Rhodes was ruined by a single decree of the Senate. In the same year, Antiochus IV Epiphanes of Syria attempted to invade Ptolemaic Egypt but was turned back by an unarmed embassy from the Roman Senate. As a result of the Macedonian and Seleucid Wars, Rome had by 160 BC gained control of both the eastern and western Mediterranean. Roman power was immense and it could be exercised to the detriment and humiliation of entire states without violence. The pressures of empire. The rapid rise in expansion of Rome within Italy and across the Mediterranean Sea exerted certain pressures and influences on the way. Roman politics and Roman society operated that set the stage for the eventual dissolution of the whole system of government that we have examined the Roman Republic. The Senate's dominance was reinforced by the wars of expansion. But senatorial politics were factious. 
the wars of expansion greatly enhanced the Senate's position of dominance. Continuing wars and Roman successes strengthened the Senate's political position in the state. While only the assemblies passed laws, it became customary for the Senate to see its advice enacted as legislation. The Senate's corporate sense of entitlement to power and leadership grew stronger, especially in the spheres of state finances and foreign affairs, the two spheres in which its supremacy was virtually unchallenged. The Senate had a strong corporate identity, but within the Senate there were sharp divisions. It was dominated by the nobles, nobiles, a small group of particularly powerful families. New arrivals, dubbed new men, met fierce snobbery. Factions were not political parties organized along ideological lines but alliances of opportunity among influential men. A faction had a leading family with a leader and satellite families and supporters in varying degrees of influence around that leader. The faction's function was to get its people placed in the most prestigious OFFICES and military commands or to block the ascent of opponents. Senatorial politics, therefore, was a personal and competitive business. Alliances within factions could form and dissolve rapidly. To a degree, foreign engagements were seen and used as tools in the constant domestic factional struggles. The growth of empire also brought social and economic pressures. A new leading class emerged. As the empire grew, entrepreneurs made profits out of exploiting the new territories. By circa 120 BC, these men were known as Roman knights, equites, and this equestrian order formed a new social class in Rome. Simplistic distinctions between knights and senators based on wealth or occupation are not convincing, the situation was more complex. Senators could take part in trade and other business. And equites could own huge amounts of land. Some senators were poorer than equites. In reality, senators and equites formed the same broad socio-economic class, all that distinguished them was participation in politics. The stratification of Roman society and politics was now much more complex. The senatorial equestrian class constituted the ruling elite. Within the senatorial class, there were divisions between patrician and plebeian, nobilis and ordinarius, established and new families. Equestrians overlapped with senators but did not take part in politics. Only senators and equestrians were eligible to stand for public office, and Iques who got elected to a magistracy entered the Senate as a new man. For the lower orders, there were also changes. For those who did not become rich, the empire was a mixed blessing. Some did well out of there, soldiering and became more affluent. Others left their home farms and never returned, or they did come home and found the farm dilapidated. More and more of the latter sold their farms and went to the city to join the head count. A manpower crisis was brewing in the mid to late 2nd century BC. Affluent senators and equestrians formed larger and larger estates. They staffed the estates with cheap slave labor. Dispossessed smallholders fell below the property qualification for military service. The Roman army began to lack manpower. The Gracchi brothers. Tiberius was motivated by a single issue that he cleaved to and forced through as best he could. But Gaius Gracchus isn't. During his tribunate, he passed a whole wide range of bills on a variety of different matters. He appears to have been more of a firebrand than his brother. More openly anti-senatorial. The Roman Revolution was not a planned event but a long series of 
interconnected events that spanned several generations. Unlike the Russian Revolution, for instance, nobody enacted the revolution for ideological reasons. Rather, it was a series of events in the domestic and foreign spheres that built on precedent to form an increasingly violent spiral of disorder and disruption. The ultimate effect of these events was to overthrow the republic and replace it with the rule of the emperors. The Tribunate of Tiberius Gracchus in 133 BC was the starting point for the revolution. A nobleman, Gracchus set out on the path of land reform. He was aware of the problems with landholding and manpower availability that had resulted from the growth of empire. As Tribune of the Plebs, he proposed a land law to reform landholding and create more small farmers who would be eligible for military service. An old law from 367 BC was to be revived, limiting the amount of public land, agar publicus, any one citizen could own. Citizens holding excessive amounts of public land had to return the surplus to the state. The repossessed land would then be distributed among the landless poor who comprised the head count. The issue of Gracchus' motivation has been a matter of scholarly controversy. Different views conclude that he was a genuine reformer working for the benefit of the state. He was a revolutionary working for personal gain. Or he was a Roman politician with one eye on a genuine need and the other on the benefits to himself and his supporters. The conflict over Gracchus' law had disastrous consequences. Gracchus bypassed the Senate and proposed the law to the people in the tribal council of the plebs. The Senate contracted another tribune, M. Octavius, to veto Gracchus' bill. Gracchus responded by having Octavius deposed by the plebiscite. He thereby undermined one of the central concepts of Roman officeholding, collegiality. His law passed, but the Senate refused to fund its implementation. Gracchus then proposed a law diverting the taxes from the new province of Asia, the former kingdom of Pergamum, to fund his land reform. He thereby insinuated the popular assembly into the Senate's traditional preserves of state finances and foreign affairs. Believing that the work of the Land Commission needed further protection, Gracchus declared his intention to stand for the Tribunate of 132 BC. Gaius Gracchus and 3,000 of his supporters perished in the ensuing street fighting. The Gracchi had challenged the Senate's authority, indicated a novel route to power at Rome, and paid a heavy price for doing so. But by suppressing them with violence, the Senate paved the way for the ultimate collapse of the Republic. Marius and Sulla Roman politics became more polarized in the wake of the Gracchi. Roman politicians increasingly fell into one of two groups. Those who followed the new route to power pointed out by the Gracchi, were termed populars, men of the people, and favored using tribunes, the tribal assembly, and an anti-senatorial posture to enable their advancement. In opposition to the populars stood the self-styled optimates, best ones, who looked to the traditional, senate-dominated way of doing things. These groups were based more on methods than on ideology in the modern sense. C. Marius, a new man from Arpinum in Italy, rose to prominence by virtue of spectacular military successes. Marius' early political career was lackluster. He first gained fame by defeating enemies of Rome in Numidia. Jugurtha, king of the Allied Kingdom of Numidia, had been fighting a war with Rome from 111 BC. Onward. Jugurtha eluded defeat through a combination of clever military tactics and bribery of Roman commanders. While serving as an officer in Numidia, 
Marius stood for the consulship of 107 BC on the promise of ending the Jugurthine War in one year. As consul for the second time in 105 BC, he ended the war and had Jugurtha captured. The officer who actually effected the capture was named L. Cornelius Sulla. Marius was now the people's military hero. In 104 to 100 BC, he achieved an unprecedented position of power as a result of the threat of Germanic tribes in the north. Since the 120s BC, two Germanic tribes, the Cimbri and Teutons, had left their native lands in Denmark and had been wandering near the Italian border and in Gaul. They had already defeated three Roman armies when, in 105 BC, they crushed a consular army at Arazio in Gallia. Transalpina, a new province formed in 121 BC. Marius enrolled and equipped at state expense the unused headcount, Capitacensi, at Rome. These soldiers were promised land grants in return for their service. The move had lasting political ramifications, largely unrealized by Marius himself. It created a landless soldiery dependent on the patronage of its commanders for the rewards of service. Through Marius' reforms, the Roman military became more efficient but also more politicized. The events of Marius' sixth consulship in 100 BC illustrate the point well. Sulla rose to prominence initially as a subordinate of Marius but later as a commander in his own right during the Social War, 91-88 BC. A patrician. Sulla emerged under Marius but had no love for him. Sulla had served with Marius against Jugurtha, whose capture he had organized, and the Teutons. Sulla hailed from an old but impoverished patrician family. The opposite of Marius. Sulla and Marius may initially have been on good terms. But they fell out at some stage. Possibly over Marius' failure to acknowledge Sulla's capture of Jugurtha. Sulla was a patrician. Unlike Marius, he is not a new man. He is from a well established if impoverished, patrician family. The royal rule of Sulla. We have seen already the development in the revolution from relatively innocuous roots to a situation involving increasing levels of disorder. Under Sulla, whole new depths of disorder were plumbed and opened for the Roman state. With the social war ended, the enmity between Marius and Sulla reached new peaks that led to the setting of the worst precedents. Yet in the Roman Revolution, during the Social War, an Eastern king had risen to challenge Roman authority in Asia, competition for the command against him led Sulla to take drastic measures. Mithridates VI Eupator of Pontus was an ambitious king who in 89 BC, took advantage of Roman preoccupations in Italy to seize Asia and raise the banner of Greek revolt against Rome. In a desperate act, the so-called Asiatic Vespers, Mithridates ordered all Romans and Italians in his realm killed on a single evening. The resulting bloodbath, by some accounts, killed as many as 80,000 people. Both Sulla and the aging Marius wanted the command against Mithridates, both for its glory and for the promise of riches that it offered. As consul, in 88 B. C. Sulla was assigned the command by the Senate. According to traditional procedure, Marius contracted a colorful tribune. P. Sulpicius. Rufus, to assign the command to him by vote of the people. Sulla's reaction and Marius' counter-reaction were both swift and violent, setting a bad precedent. 
Sulla went to his six legions in Campania and garnered their support. He then turned his army on Rome and drove Marius out of the city, calling him a tyrant. Having settled affairs in Rome and put a bounty on Marius' head, Sulla went east to fight Mithridates. Although Sulla was trying to reinforce a traditional government rather than overthrow it, he had carried out the single most revolutionary act in Roman history to that time. He had marched a Roman army against Romans. With this precedent now in play, Sulla unknowingly condemned the Republic to decades of more and increasing violence. Marius fled to Africa but in 87 B. C. Returned to Italy, joined forces with a rebel consul, L. Cornelius Cinna, and marched on Rome to reverse Sulla's settlement. Marius then wreaked his revenge on the city that had betrayed him until Cinna intervened to stop the butchery and chaos, declaring himself consul for the seventh time for 86 BC. Marius died within days of taking office. Sulla returned from the east to wage an all-out war on his opponents in Italy. After fighting a difficult and indecisive campaign against Mithridates, he returned to fight a major civil war in Italy. Between 88 and 84 BC, a strange situation obtained. Sulla was fighting a war on behalf of a Rome governed by his political opponents, a showdown was imminent. After concluding a disgraceful peace with Mithridates in 85 BC and plundering the rich cities of the East, Sulla returned to Italy in 83 BC. Sulla fought and defeated his opponents in open battle until by mid-82 BC, he was left in sole control of Rome and Italy. Under his supervision, the Roman Revolution plunged to new depths of depravity. After his victory, Sulla enacted large-scale purges called prescriptions and revived the long-dormant OFFICE of dictator, although in modified form. When he entered Rome in mid-82 BC, Sulla began to have his enemies executed piecemeal, answering appeals from the Senate for a less chaotic procedure. He organized these executions as prescriptions, which were carried out all over Italy for almost a year. Sulla and his supporters posted lists of the proscribed. People appearing on the lists could be killed for a reward. Many in Sulla's faction took the opportunity to settle old scores or to acquire desirable real estate by prescribing its owner. Sometime during this period, in 82 or 81 BC, Sulla was appointed dictator, an office that was out of favor and had lain dormant since the Hannibalic War. Sulla modified the dictatorship in two important respects. He was to hold the post not for the traditional six months, but for as long as he wanted. And he took as his specific dictatorial assignment the exceptionally broad task of writing laws and organizing the state. Sulla then used his new power to redraft the government of Rome. As dictator, Sulla issued legislation aimed at turning back the clock on the revolution and restoring traditional senatorial government. Sulla's legislation was clearly aimed at reversing the trend toward popularis government. At Rome, although thoughtful, Sulla's settlement was reactionary and Backward-looking. He muzzled the tribunate and the tribal assembly. Extribunes were debarred from holding any other OFFICE and could not propose legislation. Plebiscites were subject to a senatorial veto. He reformed the Senate, expelling many of its members and installing newcomers loyal to himself. He tried to prevent army commanders from doing what he had done. He also issued other regulations of a sensible nature that were to stand for many decades. 
such as his establishment of permanent courts of inquiry or the stiffening of the cursus honorum. In 79 BC, his legislative program completed. Sulla resigned his dictatorship and retired into private life, he died the following year. Sulla's career is emblematic of the Roman Revolution as a whole. As a person, Sulla was an odd mix of mediocrity and brilliance. Indolence and action and placidity and viciousness, he may have been a sociopath. His career illustrates the broad nature of the Roman Revolution. Personalities operating with relatively narrow vision and thereby setting dangerous precedents for the future. Sulla reacted to circumstances as he saw fit at the time, such as marching on Rome, he gave little thought to the example he was setting. His attempted restoration of senatorial government was doomed by the personal power politics of the Republic, which could not allow so useful a tool as the Tribunate to lie in abeyance for long. Within nine years of his death, Sulla's settlement had been completely dismantled, and the Roman Revolution moved into its final and bloodiest stages. Sulla's reforms undone. Over the course of the 70s BC, this Sullen restoration, the Sullen settlement, was undone completely. By 70 BC, it was entirely washed away. Immediately after Sulla's death, the bad precedent he had set for the future was made manifest. One of the consuls of 78 BC rose in armed revolt. M. Emilius Lepidus attempted to promulgate popularist legislation, such as the restoration of the tribunate and the return of confiscated land to Italians dispossessed by Sulla's program of colonization. Lepidus joined forces with rebel Italians in Etruria and northern Italy and marched on Rome in 77 BC. The Senate declared martial law and raised forces. Lepidus was defeated at the Battle of the Milvian Bridge and died. Shortly afterward, that Lepidus had attempted armed insurrection in the first place was an omen of worse to come. Lepidus revolt and that of Q. Sertorius in Spain helped bring Pompeius Magnus Pompey to prominence. Pompey had joined Sulla as a young man in 83 BC and had successfully fought against the Marians in Africa. He showed his audacity by demanding a triumph for these actions from Sulla and getting it. When Lepidus revolted, Pompey though underage and never having held a magistracy, was granted the imperium of Propraetor and was given a command. With Lepidus defeated, Pompey used his army to suggest to the Senate that he be given the command against a more powerful opponent. Q. Sertorius in Spain Sertorius was a Marian who had successfully organized Spain into a counter-Rome, complete with its own Senate and coinage. He had held out against Sulla's lieutenants and was now reinforced by the remnants of Lepidus' defeated army. Pompey was sent by the Senate to defeat Sertorius, which he did in a difficult six-year campaign that ended only when Sertorius was treacherously murdered by a jealous underling. Pompey's settlement of Spain was equitable, and he earned many friends there. While Pompey was in Spain, the plutocrat M. Licinius Crassus grew powerful at Rome, particularly as a result of a slave war in southern Italy. Crassus had benefited Ted financially from Sulla's prescriptions, although his early career was otherwise unremarkable. Crassus stemmed from an old patrician family. He greatly increased his wealth by buying up the property of the prescribed and by engaging in a variety of business ventures, such as renting out slaves. 
He deployed his wealth in vast bribing operations to secure election to magistracies, through which he advanced in proper order. Otherwise, these years at Rome were relatively tranquil, though they proved to be a calm before the storm. The revolt of Spartacus offered Crassus a chance for military glory, which was tarnished by the interference of Pompey. The massive influx of slaves into Italy as a result of the growth of empire had proven problematic for Rome. In 135 to 133 BC, there had been a huge revolt in Sicily that had needed a consular army to suppress. In 73 BC, another great slave revolt, the last in ancient history, broke out in Capua. The ringleader was a Thracian gladiator called Spartacus, who trained his army to fight efficiently and ruthlessly looted the rich properties. At first in Campania, then throughout Italy, armies sent against him were defeated until Crassus, as per Praetor in 71, defeated Spartacus and either returned the survivors to their owners or crucified them along the Via Appia to the gates of Rome. Crassus' success, however, was undermined by Pompey, who returned from Spain, assisted in the mopping up operations, and claimed some credit for suppressing the revolt. Crassus, therefore, had no love of Pompey. Crassus and Pompey became consuls for 70 BC. And, together, saw to the final dissolution of the Solon settlement. The early careers of Crassus and Pompey show us that the Solon settlement was absolutely doomed. Pompey's actions on returning from Spain are instructive. On the pretext of helping to put down Spartacus, he retained his army intact. He then camped his army near Rome and requested a consulship in recognition of his services, this despite his never having held any magistracy to that point. So green was Pompey when it came to being a magistrate that he asked the scholar M. Terentius Vero to prepare a handbook of advice for him. Crassus reacted not by challenging Pompey's threatening behavior but by Imitating it, Crassus camped his army near Rome and requested his own consulship. The known enemies therefore became consuls in 70 BC and staged a public reconciliation. The remaining inconvenient elements in Sulla's settlement were removed. The courts were taken away from sole senatorial control and divided between senators equestrians, and the mysterious Tribuni Erariae. The Senate was purged by friendly censors, the first in seventeen years, many of the expelled were Sulla's nominees. The tribunate was restored to its full pre-Sullan powers. Crassus and Pompey's motivation in doing all this was no doubt to maximize their future options for manipulating the system for their own benefit. Under the Solon settlement, they could only deal with the Senate, with that settlement overturned. They could make use of tribunes and the people as well. The early careers of Crassus and Pompey showed that the Solon settlement was doomed. Sulla's attempt to turn the clock back and restore the Senate to supremacy had failed. Roman politics had become too cutthroat to allow so useful a tool as the tribunate to languish and used. More importantly, Sulla's career itself offered an indication of the dizzying heights one could reach with military backing. That Lepidus openly and Crassus and Pompey more cryptically followed this lead boded ill for the future. Pompey and Crassus Crassus' efforts to block the enormous popularity of Pompey, which, in the course of the 60s BC rose to new heights on the back of various developments in foreign affairs, 
was to bring into the picture a new and very able player in the political theater of the Roman Revolution. Gaius Julius Caesar Events in foreign affairs in the 60s BC led to Pompey's emergence. As a popular military hero, Mithridates of Pontus was led off the hook by Sulla in 83 B. C. He started a new war in Asia in 75 BC. Despite the best efforts of Rome's generals, the war dragged on into 67 BC. Mithridates' war in Asia exacerbated the Mediterranean's pirate problem, which Pompey was selected to rectify with a grant of unprecedented power. To strengthen his position, Mithridates worked in league with the pirates of rough Cilicia, whose activities now reached an alarming new intensity, threatening the grain supply of Rome itself. The people became agitated and a tribune. A. Gabinius proposed a law conferring vast imperium on Pompey to tackle the pirate problem. The law was passed, Pompey was to have imperium infinitum, power not limited to a province, over all local governors in the entire Mediterranean Sea, all of its islands, and for fifty miles inland. The grant of Imperium was for three years to deal with the pirates. Pompey was also appointed to oversee the grain supply of Rome for five years. Pompey effected his three-year commission in three months, treating the pirates with leniency and settling them as traders and farmers in Cilicia. With the pirates defeated, Pompey had his huge imperium Julius Caesar, 100-44 BC, transferred to Asia, so he could bring the war against Mithridates to an end. Technically, Pompey's imperium had lapsed with the defeat of the pirates. A Tribune C. Manilius proposed a law in 66 B. C. Transferring Pompey's Imperium to the entire Near East to settle affairs there. With the law passed, Pompey devoted the next four years to defeating Mithridates and reorganizing the entire geopolitical situation in the Roman East. In his arrangement of Eastern affairs, Pompey behaved like an absolute monarch, forming new provinces, adjusting existing ones, making alliances, and negotiating treaties, all on his own authority. In 63 BC, Pompey's actions in the East were at an end, and he was ready to return to Rome. Crassus moved as best he could to counter the huge power and great popularity of Pompey. While Pompey was covering himself with glory in the East, Crassus did his best to undermine his position in Rome. Crassus backed several measures aimed at limiting or undermining Pompey's position and strengthening his own. He backed the career of an able young nobleman, Gaius Julius Caesar. With access to Crassus' coffers, Caesar advanced up the Cursus in proper order and, in 63 BC, he won both the praetorship and the position of Pontifex Maximus, the lifetime high priesthood of Rome that conferred huge prestige on its incumbent. Pompey's return was now imminent. Many remembered what had happened upon Sulla's advent from the East twenty years previously. An attempted coup d'etat in 63 BC highlighted how unstable Roman politics had become. L. Sergius Catalina, Catalan, a desperado who had thrice failed to gain election to the consulship, resolved on armed insurrection. There was some suspicion that Crassus was behind the plot. Yet another attempt to undermine Pompey. But this seems unlikely. There seemed to be pools of people around who seemed to be ready to take up arms against the state as soon as someone raised the banner of insurrection. Cicero One of the consuls for 63 BC Uncovered Catalan's plan Orchestrated opposition to it 
and oversaw the execution of several of the conspirators in Rome on December 5. Catalan, meanwhile, had joined his army in Etruria and was killed in battle as his army was defeated in the Phi Eld. The whole episode speaks volumes about how unstable the Roman Republic had become as a result of 70 years of revolutionary politics. The First Triumvirate. It seemed that Caesar was the chief mover here, proposing that Pompey be brought in and join forces with them, and that Crassus, Pompey's old rival and Caesar's former patron, also be brought into the deal. This is an informal political arrangement that most modern scholars refer to as the First Triumvirate. Pompey's return from the East was not marked by the despotism and prescriptions that many had feared. Opposition in the Senate, led by a group of die-hard conservatives under M. Porcius Cato, forced Pompey and Crassus into an uneasy political alliance with Caesar as the glue. Pompey returned to Italy in 62 BC, disbanded his army, and entered the city as a private citizen. Any relief that people felt was short-lived, since the Senate promptly began filibustering in the matter of Pompey's two basic demands: land for his veterans and ratify Catian of his eastern settlements. In doing so. The Senate was following the direction of Crassus as well as the die-hard conservatives led by M. Porcius Cato, sometimes called Cato the Younger, the great grandson of Cato Censorinus, the censor. Now that its hero's work was done, the mob showed little enthusiasm for Pompey's attempted bypassing of the Senate by means of a tribune. When Caesar returned from his governorship of Spain in 60 BC. He also faced the newly obdurate Senate and was blocked in his requests for a triumph and consulship. This opposition actually wrought dire results for the Republic. Caesar approached Pompey and proposed an alliance against the Senate. Caesar also brought in Crassus, his old patron, the three most powerful, ruthless. And unscrupulous men in the state were now working together, and they arranged for Caesar to be elected consul for 59 BC. The triumvirate's existence was made manifest in Caesar's consulship, which was marked by violence, intimidation, and legislation to benefit himself, Pompey, and Crassus. Caesar assigned to himself a five-year command in Cisalpine and Transalpine Gaul, and in Illyria, he would command five legions when his consulship ended. Pompey saw to the passage of a land law benefiting his veterans, and his eastern settlements were ratified. Crassus gained several profitable laws, particularly in relation to the tax returns from Asia. All of these measures were passed by means of violence and intimidation. The meetings that dealt with the passage of Pompey's land bill offer a good illustration of Caesar's methods. In the face of opposition from his colleague in the consulship, M. Calpurnius Bibulus, Caesar summoned a popular meeting to question Bibulus on his opposition. Caesar then summoned another meeting and invited Crassus and Pompey to speak on the merits of the land bill. On the night before the voting, Caesar's followers occupied the forum and, as the voting proceeded, prevented Bibulus and three tribunes from making their way to the podium to intercede their veto. Bibulus and his colleagues were manhandled. The consular fasces were broken. And Bibulus himself was smeared with dung. The group had to flee to a shrine of Jupiter to seek refuge from the mob. In the wake of these events, Bibulus stayed home for the rest of his consulship. Indeed, 
he was besieged there. As a result, Caesar had a free reign to behave as he saw fit. Following his consulship in 59 BC, Caesar took up his five-year command in Transalpine Gaul and used it to embark on a full-scale war in the rest of Gaul. This war, which lasted ten years, was not mandated by the Senate that is a very important point to appreciate. That Caesar's commentaries should be read, above all, as pieces of political propaganda. It was a remarkable military achievement and saw Caesar carry Roman arms over the Rhine into Germany and across the English Channel into Britain. By the end of the war in 49 BC, Caesar had added all of modern day France and parts of modern day Switzerland, Holland, and Germany to the Roman Empire. Caesar's conquests also carried urbanized Mediterranean culture into northern Europe on a permanent basis and, as such, had a profound effect on subsequent European history. Caesar's campaigns in Gaul are described in compelling detail in his own commentaries, a model of concise, clear, and clipped Latin prose that was much admired by contemporaries. The commentaries also served as political propaganda for Caesar, broadcasting his military glory. Pompey and Caesar Caesar's achievements in Gaul caused some tensions within the triumvirate, now the dominant force in domestic politics. Tensions within the triumvirate were exploited by the Senate in an attempt to drive a wedge into the alliance. The career of P. Clodius Pulcher is illustrative. Clodius was a tribune in 58 BC. Through the proposal of popular measures backed by intimidation and thuggery, he all but ruled in Rome. He was perceived as a member of Caesar's camp. But this is only partially true. After gaining ascendancy over the mob, Clodius attacked Pompey. First, Cicero, a supporter of Pompey, was banished in 58 BC. Then Clodius' thugs turned on Pompey himself. Pompey organized his own gang of thugs under T. Annius Milo, which basically vied with Clodius' group over the next five years. However, in 57 BC, Pompey restored order and stabilized Rome's grain supply, thus becoming the ascendant triumvir in Rome. All of these circumstances raised tensions in the triumvirate, now exploited by a conservative faction in the Senate who, led by Cato and Cicero, began lobbying for Caesar's recall and prosecution for his behavior as consul in 59 BC. Caesar called a meeting at the town of Lucca, just inside his province, in 56 BC to resolve these tensions. At this meeting, several important agreements Cicero, Roman order and statesmen were reached. Caesar, whose conquest of Gaul was not complete, had his command extended for a further five years. To balance this move, Pompey was given a five-year command in Spain, with a dispensation to exercise it through legates, chafing for military glory to match that of his colleagues. Crassus got a five-year command in Syria. Crassus and Pompey were to be consuls in 55 BC. Events in 54-49 BC brought the triumvirate to an end. Left Caesar and Pompey facing off against each other, and eventually led to civil war. First, in 54 BC, Julia, Caesar's daughter and Pompey's wife, died in childbirth. The marital link between Pompey and Caesar was broken, and it was not renewed. Also in 54 BC, Crassus set off to earn his military glory by attacking the neighboring Parthian Empire on Rome's eastern frontier. 
greatly underestimating the military abilities of the largely cavalry-based Parthian forces. Crassus met defeat and death at the Battle of Carrion. B.C. His death left Caesar and Pompey alone in the triumvirate. In 52 BC, the situation in Rome reached a new nadir. Street fighting between Clodius and Milo effectively blocked government and saw Clodius murdered in the Senate House burned to the ground, igniting widespread fires in Rome. A senatus consultum optimum was declared and Pompey was appointed sole consul for the year to restore order, which he did by force. The Optimates exploited the growing rift between Caesar and Pompey and forced civil war in 49 BC. In the years 52-49 BC, the calls of the Optimates for Caesar's prosecution grew more strident, exploiting Pompey's vacillating character and recent good work on behalf of the state. The Optimates manipulated him into believing he was the protector of tradition against the threat of Caesarian domination. While not openly hostile to his supposed ally, Pompey nevertheless did little to block the moves against Caesar during these years. As his command in Gaul drew to a close, Caesar faced political extinction and possibly assassination at the hands of his enemies if he returned to Rome as a private citizen. Caesar attempted to negotiate for an end to the deadlock. But the Optimates blocked his every move. In December of 50 BC, Caesar issued his final offer. He and Pompey would relinquish their commands simultaneously. The Senate voted 370 to 22 in favor of the motion, thereby isolating the ultra-conservative element. Not to be outdone. The Optimates prevailed on Pompey to mobilize his legions and save the Republic. In response, Caesar moved his legions close to Italy. Despite several last-minute attempts to avoid civil war, on January 10, 49 BC he crossed the Rubicon, the river that marked the border between Italy and his province. In doing so, Caesar declared war on the state. The greatest of all of Rome's civil wars had begun. The domination of Caesar. The civil war of 49 to 45 BC was tantamount to a Roman world war. In its extent, throughout, Caesar's military genius shone brightly. Despite being outnumbered, Caesar and his famed speed of movement, Celeritas, drove Pompey and the Optimates out of Italy in 49 BC and eastward toward Pompey's power base. After breaking a siege at Dyrrhachium, Pompey moved eastward and was engaged by Caesar at Pharsalus in northern Greece in 48 BC. Despite a great numerical disadvantage, Caesar's experienced legions crushed their opponents. Reviewing the carnage in the aftermath of the battle, Caesar commented, It was they who wanted it so. Pompey fled the field and headed further east to continue the fight. Stopping in Egypt. However, he was ignominiously murdered by a local claimant to the Ptolemaic throne. Having chased Pompey to Egypt, Caesar got embroiled in dynastic politics there and was delayed in Alexandria during the winter of 48 to 47 BC. This was also when Caesar commenced his love affair with Cleopatra, one of the protagonists in the Egyptian dynastic feud and an able and ambitious woman. The affair produced a son, Caesar Ion, born in 47 BC. Next, Caesar fought local renegades and supporters of Pompey in Asia, Africa, and Spain, defeating all in his path. In 47 BC, he suppressed a native revolt in Asia in five days. 
giving rise to his famous dictum Veni, Vidi, Vici, I came, I saw, I won. In 46 BC, he fought a set-piece battle in Thapsus in Africa, defeating the Pompeians decisively. In the wake of this defeat, the leader of the Optimates, Cato, committed suicide at Utica in Africa. The following year, 45 BC, Caesar crushed another of Pompey's armies at Munda in Spain. The Battle of Munda marked the official end of the civil war. Although pockets of resistance to Caesar and his successors were to continue for a decade. After Munda, Caesar was the unchallenged master of the Roman world. Caesar's means of legitimizing his constitutional position showed a disregard for traditional forms and conservative sensibilities. Caesar enacted a policy of sparing his captured opponents, Clementia which was a shrewd political maneuver to place them forever under an obligation to him. He placed some of his spared opponents in positions of responsibility in his new regime. But when Caesar began to organize his official position in the state, he revealed an almost total lack of tact in his exercise of power. Ignoring its hateful associations with Sulla, Caesar employed the dictatorship in conjunction with frequent consulships, as his office of choice. In 49 BC, Caesar was dictator for only 11 days, long enough to organize consular elections and see himself installed as consul for 48 BC. In 47 BC, he resumed the dictatorship and held it continuously from then until his death. In fact, it was extended from a one-year to a ten-year duration in 46 BC and to lifetime tenure in February 44 BC. Aside from this irregular usage of the Republican offices, Caesar displayed in his words and deeds little concern for conservative opinion. He said that Sulla did not know his ABCs when he gave up the dictatorship, thereby signaling his intent to rule as dictator for as long as he could. He declared the Republic a mere word without form or substance. On one occasion, he greeted the senators while seated like a despot. The Senate, in response, acted with abject sycophancy in voting him honors, including even deification. In 44 BC, the infamous crown offering incident occurred, which was taken by many as a sign that Caesar's ultimate goal was kingship itself. As dictator, Caesar passed a mass of legislation on various issues, but none of it was aimed at regularizing his position or tackling the fundamental ills of the state. In fact, Caesar was planning another major military enterprise against the Parthians when disaster overcame him in March of 44 BC. Alarmed by Caesar's openly autocratic behavior, a group of nobles numbering perhaps 80 members and led by C. Cassius Longinus conspired to assassinate the tyrant. It carried out the act on March 15, the Ides of March. 44 BC but the limited focus of the so-called liberators proved their greatest mistake. At a Senate meeting in Pompey's theater, Caesar was surrounded by a group of conspirators and was cut down at the foot of Pompey's statue by 23 stab wounds, declaring the tyrant justly killed. The conspirators rushed from the scene, believing they had restored the Republic to liberty. Events were to prove them mistaken. Antony and Octavian Octavian was really an unknown, untried entity, and by being adopted by Caesar, some of his supporters and family members felt that his life was in grave danger, either from the liberators or from a jealous Mark Antony. 
The liberators had formulated no plan for what to do once Caesar was dead. And this gave Caesar's faction an opportunity to organize itself. The liberators seemed to believe that the Republic would spring. Reborn. Phoenix-like. From the ashes of Caesar's tyranny. They made no. Plans to dispose of Caesar's supporters. Now led by Marcus Antonius, Mark Antony. Caesar's right-hand man. They made no moves to secure broader military or popular support. Worried by the mob's sullen reception of their newly won liberty, the liberators withdrew to the capital in fear. As the confusion began to die down and the Caesarians realized they were not targets of murder plots, Mark Antony seized the initiative from the inert assassins. He staged Caesar's funeral in the very center of Rome. In the Forum, here he gave an inflammatory speech and unveiled Caesar's will, in which the dictator left 300 sesterces to every Roman citizen in the city. These actions, combined with the pathetic sight of their hero's butchered corpse, roused the mob into a riot in which the liberators were forced to flee the city altogether. With the liberators driven out, Antony stood supreme in the Caesarian camp. Caesar's will contained a surprise for Antony and brought into play a man who was eventually to emerge as Rome's first emperor. In addition to various bequests to the mob, Caesar designated in his will his great-nephew, Octavius, as his adopted son. Octavius, only 18 years old in March 44 BC and of obscure origins by Roman noble standards was away in Illyricum, training to join Caesar's planned Parthian campaign. When he heard of his adoption by Caesar, he acted with great boldness and traveled to Rome to claim his inheritance. Now with the name C. Julius Caesar Octavianus, hereafter Octavian. The young man met with Antony to stake his claim. Antony acted with unwise. Haste and snubbed the youth out of hand, it proved a mistake. Meanwhile, the Senate vacillated, and tensions between the liberators and Antony erupted into open conflict. The Senate's confusion is evidenced by its simultaneous pardoning of the liberators and ratify Cadian of all of Caesar's acts. Antony and the liberators appeared to be coming to an understanding insofar as the Senate assigned commands to members of the conspiracy and to Caesarians alike. Antony reshuffle ed the Senate's allotment of commands to favor himself, giving himself Cisalpine and Transalpine Gaul, in addition to Macedonia as assigned him by the Senate. The Senate's appointee to Cisalpine Gaul, the conspirator D. Brutus, refused to relinquish his command, as he considered Antony's claim to it illegitimate. Antony then marched against Brutus and besieged him at Mutina in his province. Antony now made a move against Octavian, and he attempted to have him arraigned on trumped-up charges. In response, Octavian raised two legions from among his father's veterans in Italy, a force soon augmented by mass defections from among Antony's troops such was the pull of the name Caesar. A two-sided power struggle now evolved between the liberators and the Caesarians on the one hand and between Antony and Octavian within the Caesarian camp on the other. The ineffectual senate was caught in the middle. In the matter of Mutina, the senate sided with Brutus its appointee to Cisalpine Gaul, and commanded the consuls for 43 BC to relieve him from Antony's siege. At Cicero's instigation, the Senate conferred propraetorian status on Octavian and assigned him the task of helping the consuls remove Antony, thus making him help one of his uncles and adoptive fathers, assassins. 
both Cicero for having brought Octavian on board, then having snubbed him and ignored him. The Senate now had to put up with his military autocracy in the city of Rome itself. In fighting outside Mutina, Antony was bested and withdrew to his province in Transalpine Gaul. But within a few weeks, he had returned with a huge force drawn from Spain and Gaul and occupied Cisalpine Gaul unopposed. Octavian had assisted Brutus in Mutina, but he refused to cooperate with him further and returned to Rome, expecting appreciation and some reward from the Senate, instead. He found himself snubbed. Having declared Antony a public enemy, the Senate honored the liberators and snubbed Octavian. With disastrous results, Decimus Brutus was granted triumph. Antony was outlawed. And Octavian was ignored. Octavian then marched his army to Rome in the late fall of 43 BC and occupied it. He staged consular elections and saw himself elected consul at age 20. He formalized his rift with the liberators by having their amnesty of the previous year revoked. Far from discarding Octavian, the Senate now had to endure his unbridled military autocracy. But Octavian realized his ascendancy was temporary and turned his mind to making his position more secure. The Second Triumvirate The Second Triumvirate was a period when Octavian and Antony joined hands and formed a body to run the state. Effectively a military. Junta. They also dealt decisively with the liberators in the eastern half of the empire and then they divided the empire up between themselves and began to govern. Octavian's position in the early fall of 43 BC was precarious. Antony was marshalling huge forces in both Gauls. Driven from Rome and Italy, the liberators fled to the east, there to organize republican resistance to Caesarian domination. To strengthen his position, Octavian mended his bridges with Antony and, together with another leading Caesarian, M. Emilius Lepidus, formed the Second Triumvirate. Together, they marched their combined forces to Rome. The Second Triumvirate differed significantly from the first. Its dominance was formalized in a law passed by a tribune. P. Titius. On November 27, B.C. According to this law, Antony, Lepidus, and Octavian were named Triumviriae Publici Constituendi Consulari Potestate, Board of Three, with consular power for the organization of the state, for a period of five years. In effect, the three were a military junta with dictatorial powers. The second triumvirate dominated Roman politics for the next decade. But like in its informal predecessor, the relationship between the triumvirs was strained. Short of money to pay their troops, the first act of the new triumvirate was to instigate proscriptions of the suspect in the city and in Italy. Thousands perished and had their property confiscated. The leading victim of these prescriptions was Cicero, who had supported Octavian against Antony in the affair of Mutina. He had delivered devastating oratorical attacks against Antony in the Senate, the speeches called Philippics survive extant. Antony did not forget Cicero's enmity and Octavian acquiesced in having his former supporter prescribed. Chased down while fleeing to the coast, Cicero was decapitated on 7. December. His head and hands were nailed to the speaker's platform, Rostra, in the Roman Forum, the place where Cicero had delivered so many of his famous orations. The triumvirs also orchestrated the deification of their slain leader. 
C. Julius Caesar and initiated the construction of his temple in the Roman Forum. Octavian could now claim divine descent. He immediately added Divophilius, son of a god, to his nomenclature. The triumvirs then moved against the liberators. The liberators were Buildings signify camp forces in Greece and the East. Antony and Octavian went east with their combined forces and met the Republican armies at Philippi in September 42 BC. In two related battles, the Republicans were bested. And Cassius and Brutus, the leaders of the conspiracy, committed suicide. Notably, Octavian was a sickly youth, and he played little or no role in these victories. The Caesarians were now supreme in the Roman world. Tensions within the Triumvirate emerged almost immediately. When the Triumvirate had been formed, Lepidus had been assigned a minor territory in Africa. So he was effectively sidelined as a major player. Following Philippi, Antony moved further east. Since this is where most of his assigned territories lay, Octavian stayed in Italy. Octavian made himself unpopular with his arrogant attitude and massive confiscations of land. To settle his veterans, the obscure affair of Perugia showed how tense were the relations between Antony and Octavian. In 41 BC, Mark Antony's brother, L. Antonius, and his wife, Fulvia, fomented armed insurrection against Octavian in Italy. Mark Antony's involvement is moot, but the actions themselves speak volumes about the perceived relationship between the two leading triumvirs. Antony moved west in 41 to 40 BC and civil war between him and Octavian seemed imminent. At a meeting at Brundisium in 40 BC, however, their differences were resolved and the assignment of territories was refined. Octavian got the entire west, Antony the east, and Lepidus was confirmed in Africa. Antony was married to Octavian's sister, Octavia since Fulvia had died shortly after the Perusine affair. For the next four years, the triumvirs were primarily engaged with affairs in their respective halves of the empire. The triumvirate was renewed. Lepidus was squeezed out. And Octavian and Antony focused their attention on their own spheres of jurisdiction. In 37 BC, the triumvirate was renewed for a further five years. With Lepidus still holed up in Africa. Sextus Pompeius, a son of Pompey, had organized a sort of pirate kingdom in Sicily and Sardinia that took Octavian four years to suppress. Following Sextus' defeat in 36 BC, Lepidus made his move and tried to seize Italy and Sicily but was easily put down by Octavian. Lepidus was stripped of his triumviral powers and retired to a seaside town near Rome. Antony, meanwhile, was occupied in the east with ineffectual campaigns against the Parthians. He made his base in Alexandria and inherited Caesar's dalliance with the Ptolemaic queen, Cleopatra. Octavian emerges supreme. In the five years following 36 BC, Octavian reinvented himself as the savior of traditions of the West and launched a propaganda campaign against Antony. Seeing the broad support he had garnered in his struggle against Sextus Pompeius, Octavian determined to change his political image and seek bases for his power other than the military. In so doing, 
Octavian showed that he was already thinking in the longer term about how the Roman state could be reorganized and rendered stable once more. In a remarkable political PR stunt, he began to position himself as the defender of traditional Western Roman ways. He did so mainly by portraying Antony as in the thrall of a foreign despot who had designs on the Roman Empire as whole. Antony's behavior played directly into Octavian's hands, particularly the event in 34 BC known as the Donations of Alexandria. Antony and Cleopatra lived openly as a couple in Alexandria. Despite Antony's marriage to Octavia in 34 BC, to celebrate his victories against the Parthians, Antony staged a pageant in the gymnasium in Alexandria. In this Donations of Alexandria, Antony and Cleopatra appeared enthroned with their three children and Caesarion. Caesarion was hailed as king of kings, Cleopatra as queen of kings. The Eastern Roman Empire was divided among Antony and Cleopatra and their three children. And Caesarion was acclaimed the true son of Caesar. A direct challenge to the basis of Octavian's legitimacy. Given these factors, Antony and Octavian began preparing for war. After a diplomatic war of words in 33-32 BC. The Civil War. When it came. Proved anticlimactic. Antony and Octavian had very different reactions to the lapse and non renewal of the triumvirate in 33 BC. Antony behaved as if the lapse had not occurred. And he continued to use the title of triumvir until his death. Now the respecter of Roman ways. Octavian abandoned the title and technically reverted to the status of a private citizen. However, Using tribunes in intimidation, he successfully outmaneuvered the consuls of 33 BC, both of whom supported Antony, and drove Antony's supporters in the Senate out of Italy. In 32 BC, Octavian revealed the contents of Antony's will, which shocked public opinion in the West. Antony declared Caesarion the true heir of Caesar. Antony wished to be buried by Cleopatra's side. Rumors that Antony intended to move the seat of Roman government to Alexandria and install Cleopatra as Queen of the Romans turned the tide of opinion in favor of Octavian. Italy and soon the western provinces took an oath of allegiance to Octavian. This oath became the basis of Octavian's claim to leadership of the West. In contrast, Antony had no legal standing whatsoever in Roman eyes. The two leaders moved against each other in the summer of 31 BC. But the war, declared against Cleopatra, ended quickly. Antony's armies and fleet moved into Greece and camped at Actium on the Adriatic. Octavian moved to counter him with 30 legions and some 600 ships under the direct command of M. Vipsanius Agrippa, one of Octavian's leading supporters from the very beginning his career in 44 BC. Octavian's fleet crushed the combined navy of Antony and Cleopatra in the bay at Actium on September 2, 31 BC. The land forces did not engage. In the wake of Actium, Antony and Cleopatra fled back to Egypt, Pursued by Octavian. As Octavian closed in on Alexandria in 30 BC, Cleopatra committed suicide, followed shortly thereafter by Antony. Caesarion was murdered. But Antony's children by Cleopatra were spared. Octavian annexed Egypt as a province thereby ending the history of the last and longest lived of the Hellenistic kingdoms. Octavian also gained access to the vast wealth of the Ptolemies, allowing him to pay off his troops with money to spare. 
in 29 BC. His victory complete and now in sole control of the entire Roman world. Octavian returned a hero to Rome and began the long process of reorganizing the state. His emergence as sole ruler also brought the Roman Revolution to an end. New Order of Augustus Over the course of his long reign, 31 BC to AD 14, Octavian reorganized the Roman state. After an initial period following Asham, Octavian gradually arranged the state on a new footing and placed himself at its head. The development of the new order was an evolutionary process of trial and error. Adjustment and refinement. That lasted almost 30 years. By 2 BC, Octavian renamed Augustus in 27 BC had re-established the tottering Roman state by virtue of a governmental system termed the Principate. In his creation of the Principate, Augustus was primarily concerned with preventing more civil war, bringing stability to the Roman state, and avoiding the fate of his adoptive father, Caesar. From 31 to 27 BC, Octavian held the consulship continuously and he appears to have relied on the oath of 32 BC as the ultimate source of his legitimacy. Beginning in 27 BC, he began to regularize his position more systematically. There were many phases in the development of his position and the evolution Augustus. Rome's first emperor.